realistic human characters like the beautiful girl or the handsome guy are always the toughest things to do in traditional animation. They're difficult to draw and they're difficult for the acting because they're very subtle. When we were first going to do The Little Mermaid, it was the first fairy tale in 30 years, and we wanted to go back to some techniques that had been used in the classic ones like Cinderella, Snow White, and Sleeping Beauty. And one of those was the shooting of live action reference as an assist for the animators to help unify both difficult drawing problems and to get a lot of different animators working on the same page in terms of a character. This was a technique that uh, Walt had done as far back as Snow White. But it hadn't really been done in the latter years by the time when I had started at the studio. We didn't really know or have the tools at our immediate disposal. We weren't sure quite how to do it again. So we actually enlisted the aid of some people who were involved in some of those early shoots, including Catherine Beaumont, who was the voice of both Alice in Alice in Wonderland, and Wendy and Peter Pan. And we brought her in, and we had a long talk with her about the actual shooting, what it involved. I walked into the conference room. There was a long table with all of these directors, writers, everybody, who were curious about what the live action process was. Rehearsal, we're ready for you now, Catherine. Oh, uh, do excuse me, please. So I talked about my work on the sound stage, the big sound stage, which was totally empty, except just a few things to help you do your movements, although some of them were very interesting, <laughs> as it turned out with Alice in Wonderland. You actually compare the animation of the classic features of the golden age of animation, from Snow White, Pinocchio, Fantasia, to just the animation that was being done like 10 years before that. The whole technique of animation advanced tremendously during that time and the animators studying live action really was a big part of that because they really learned a lot of the subtleties of acting and movement. You want to form an emotional connection with the audience to the character and an important part of that is making the character believable. That's quite a tall order for you to have the audience believe that this series of drawings is actually a living, breathing human being. In preparation for Snow White, Disney did a short called Goddess of Spring. That was kind of almost like a rehearsal for Snow White. And they had a kind of realistic human character, and they did not shoot live action. And it um, didn't turn out real well. It was very rubber hosey as she moved kind of swimmy and, and not in a convincing way. After that, they realized that they had to do something to make Snow White effective. They couldn't just animate right. her traditionally. So they hired a young dancer, Marge Champion, and they shot reference of her dressed in a simple sort of Snow White outfit, and that really became the basis for her performance. The technique of rotoscoping is literally just tracing the images that you shoot. And unfortunately, when you do that, the performance is, is very flat. The characters really don't live. And so what Walt and his artists learned rather quickly is if you just take some of the key poses and use those to kind of build your animation around, then the artist puts in all of the craft and skill that they know using those poses that brings the characters to life. In all the live action that we've done in the films we've made, we haven't done rotoscoping. It feels unbelievable in, in a weird sort of way, almost because it's too realistic. So we always use the live action as a reference. Storyboarding is the first process. Still drawings that just kind of tell the story. We have the sequence worked out scene by scene. So that becomes our guide to shooting the live action. We wanted to get really good actors to do the live action because many different animators would work on a character like Ariel, and we wanted to make sure there was a consistency to that performance. Sherry Stoner he was in the Groundlings, which is a group of improv comedians that came to the studio over on Flower Street. We did a little workshop at Disney for the animators, sort of teaching them how to improvise and move around and stuff like that, loosen them up. But Ron and John must have been in the audience because they had me come in and audition. <laughs> What's your name? Ariel. Sherry was a wonderful comedian. Ready, camera. There's a big scene where Ariel is having this nice, elegant dinner at the palace. She thinks the fork is a comb, and she starts combing her hair and seeing everybody stare at her strangely and realizes somehow I'm doing something I shouldn't be, and then takes the pipe and, and sort of thinks it's a musical instrument. 
Those things were really fun. Just look at her! Glenn Keane would have very specific ideas about how he wanted a certain part of the piece to be staged. Oh, so jump in, dance. But within that, um, I would improvise certain things. Like, hair like would get in my eyes, I would do that sort of thing, and that became sort of part of the character. Or if I was nervous and I moved my hands like this or something, they would put that in. So they allowed me to play within the confines of what they had in mind. A girl rescued me. She, she was singing. Josh Finkel was our Eric to Sherry's Ariel, and he also was tremendous and willing. It looks just like him. I would get a packet from Disney that would contain the storyboards of the sequences we're about to do, and then the audio tracks of the pre-recorded voices of those sequences. And basically, it was my job to put those two things together. You look wonderful. Ariel notices that the crab is on Grimsby's plate. Grimsby isn't paying any attention. The comedy of the scene was already there. It was just me playing it out in a comedic way. We did kind of a master where just the two of us were sitting next to each other. They had a chafing dish from the cafeteria that they used, and then they would just try different shots and improvisations of, you know, do it later, do it earlier. Well, what is it? Would you like to join me on a tour of my kingdom tomorrow? Josh Finkel had a theater background, and he was comfortable with phrasing his movements and staging things for an effect as you would in a play. He brought a kind of a theatricality to the prince. I'm um, telling you, Grim, she was real. I'm gonna find that girl and I'm gonna marry her. The original live action reference process, they shot on film, and they were fairly elaborate. There was a lot of attention to detail in terms of if the character was walking down steps. They had steps built. They wanted to make sure that these live action scenes were staged as closely to the way it was gonna be laid out in animation. And we just didn't have the budget or the time to do it exactly that way. So uh, what are we doing? <laughs> So we used video. Ready, camera. I lost her once. I'm not going to lose her again. <laughs> right. Cut, cut. Our big Apple sets were, were apple carts and risers. And then at the backdrop, there was a grid that's lined off with tape. That gave you a vertical and horizontal measure so that if you want to walk, you have a point of reference for animators to look at. We had our puppets and our props yes, and our things. Props were just, I think, whatever they sort of could pull together that was sort of lying around. Like, they got a puppet that was about roughly the size of Flounder to Ariel. You want thingamabobs? I got 20. Whatever worked. You know. <laughs> so the shooting sessions were a lot of fun. There's some pretty silly stuff <laughs> we used to do. <laughs> when we storyboarded film, and it blocks out the broadest actions. But every detail isn't there, certainly, and the animators bring a lot of that to it. We would discuss it with Sherry, and we'd kind of walk through it, see how it looked for camera. And we had ideas, and she had ideas. And certainly, Glenn Kink was really inspired by Sherry. We wanted her to come up with things that we wouldn't think of, or even that the animators wouldn't think of. When she was on the rock, she's lost her voice, and she comes and meets the prince. I think we gave Sherry the direction. You know, you can't talk, you're trying to communicate all these things that happen to you, so you can kind of do it like charades. They left it pretty much up to me to try and communicate like this and all that, you know, like, you know? But then she sort of falls and stuff into his arms, and that was at a specific point. They had that all laid out, but the, you know, that sort of thing was left to me. Part of what live action can be used for is difficult to draw angles, complex bits of choreography, uh, as well as ideas of performance and movement. You would think a walk is the most common thing, but the walk is actually one of the most difficult things to animate convincingly. Live action can really give you a leg up, so to speak. When there's a good silhouette, it gives the animator a much clearer thing in terms of making a nice drawing out of that. There's a term in animation called overlap. When something moves, something drags behind it, and then it sort of catches up. So if you have a cape and you twirl, the cape kind of keeps moving after you stop. Live action is very valuable for that. Anything that moves and has overlap, we would want to get very clearly in the live action. With Little Mermaid, we had meetings and meetings about Ariel's hair. At WDI, they have this tank that's got portals on it so that you can study the effects of certain things underwater. We wanted to see how, how hair moved. It was all good, except that the water was not heated. 
So it was Arctic. So I couldn't stay down there very long. I might do that, but I was just, I was having such a blast. They were like, are you okay? You're sure you're okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, just tell me. And they would be like, okay, swim to the right, then swim to the left, then go down and then up, you know, and then come back up and see if you're okay. One of the other things that's complex to do in animation is when there's real interaction between two human characters. Ready, camera. And we did it very simply, as I recall, but it helped because you could see in these pivoting shots where the camera was moving around, how to draw them, sort of situate them in the boat, and that, that sort of physical thing, as well as the performance things. <laughs> Felt great. <laughs> Part of your world was a really important moment a beautiful song that, that Howard and Alan had, had written. When the time came to shoot the live action, that was one of kind so, of the key, yeah. key scenes. When we shoot this live action, she's actually acting to playback of Jody Benson's track. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? It was Glenn's idea getting this pan around the grotto, which is very tricky to do in a two-dimensional art form. So we came up with this idea where we put Sherry on a chair and pivoting the chair down out of camera, we timed the turn on, on the chair so that when we combined it with a two-dimensional pan of the background, it really gave this kind of magical yeah. feeling of being in the round and being able to see that whole grotto. And then later, we had the, the sort of key shot where she reaches up out of the grotto at the end. And that was a complex shot from a technical point of view. It was helpful then to shoot that with Sherry and to get the force perspective as her hand came up into camera to really see how that hand would work and recede. Some people, when watching Mermaid at the time, felt like it was a little more cinematic, possibly, than some of the films that came before it. And if that's true, I think part of that could be because of shooting the live action, it really did have an influence on the staging and the cinematography. Wandering free, wish I could be part of that world. That's a good take. Man. Yeah. When I came to the studio in the mid-70s, Eric Larson was in charge of the animation training program. He had animated the character Cinderella, among many great things he animated, along with Mark Davis. And I complimented him on his animation on that. And he was very quick to credit Helene Stanley, who had shot the live action, because he felt like he had really gotten so much inspiration from her work. Walt's philosophy was, it's a team effort. And I was very much aware, as I began working for Disney, that that's how everything was. And they sort of made me part of this team. And I saw Alice coming alive. And I almost looked at her as being this different character. But I was told that when they saw Alice animated, they could see me, <laughs> because my personality came through. Sometimes it's hard to separate Sherry from the fact that then you had Jody, who was equally vested in the character, and then Glenn and myself and all the other animators that worked on bringing her to life. It's truly a very collaborative effort. The live action reference just gave you a good foundation. 